Yeah, good morning, everybody. It's uh, Eric Nantier. Uh, I will share this session today. Um, no. I welcome you in this team, uh, ATM operation and performance. Uh, I was uh, I'm an early retired, uh, was working with Swiss International Airlines from, uh, until the end of October, and today I'm a self employed working as a consultancy. Uh, I will share this session today. So please, if you have question, uh, put it on the question and answer because uh, speakers are very interesting to have it. Uh, so three speakers today are uh, Trang Win from Australia. Uh, it's not the night for Trang, we know it. So it's, uh, it's okay, so it's still, so it's great. Uh, Heinrich uh, Adel will be the second one and we finish uh, three card rice. As I, said, I will start down with the first speaker, actually. Uh, the first speaker for this session is Trang. She's working at uh, ATM Performance Analyst by Air Services Australia in Melbourne. Like I say, it's about nine o'clock in Melbourne, actually. And she has a focus on the flight performance, efficiency, and uh, environmental impact. Very important subject for us today uh, for the near future. And she presents us today ENSP measure and flight descent performance. Uh, trying, uh, trying, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric, for the introduction. I'll just share my screen now. Um, so yes. hopefully that's showing up okay. All right, good. Okay, so welcome everyone to this session on NSP measures of flight descent performance. And on behalf of my colleagues, Alicia Thomas and Jesper Brunswart at Air Services Australia, I would like to thank Cesar very much in uh, giving us the opportunity to present our work here today at Cesar Innovation Days and uh, yeah, coming live from Australia. <laughs> So just to go through today's agenda briefly, um, I'd like to go through the background of the work and provide some information on continuous descent operations and also manage descents and introduce the current implementation of the metric that we've developed for identifying managed descents and then also look at the application of the metric to the Australian region. So hopefully it is equally relevant and uh, interesting to other regions around the world that aim to look at uh, flight descent performance. And then, of course, uh, going into the conclusion with some final remarks and then jumping into the question and answer session. So firstly, go, going through the background of continuous descent operations. So globally, it is known as a technique which is to um, minimize fuel burn emissions and also noise during descent. And the ICAO definition includes these uh, very important uh, areas that uh, contribute to the successful execution of CDO. So the first one is the enablement of CDO through airspace and procedure design, and also the facilitation of CDO by the ATC during operations, and also the optimization of the flight profile and the management of the flight profile by the operator. So all of these aspects uh, work together to um, uh, to uh, contribute to the successful execution of the CDO. And in particular, we'd want to look at the flight optimization and management in a bit more detail. So on board uh, modern airliners these days, we have automation managed descents. Um, so for example, on the Airbus A320 or the Boeing 737, the descent can be managed by the flight management system. So typically this is computed pre-flight where the flight management system computes the flight profile according to the flight plan. And this usually consists for medium and large jets, a constant MAC and then a constant CAS descent, which has been derived from the cost index that the operator wants to fly at. And then this constitutes the performance path of des the descent. And then looking uh, further beyond the performance path, uh, the profile also uh, takes into account uh, airspace and procedural constraints. For example, uh, 250 knots below 10,000 feet, 
or any uh, altitude constraints like at or below constraints, and then any further uh, constraints in the TMA. So the computation of this flight profile, as mentioned, is uh, done pre-flight. However, during operations, uh, some intervention can uh, interrupt this uh, pre-planning that the operator has done for managing the descent. So going into the continuous descent and how NSPs measure it today. So conventionally, uh, NSPs would uh, measure a continuous descent by the identification of a level segment. And if there is the absence of the level segments, then that constitutes a continuous descent operation. However, when we look at uh, continuous descents by the onboard flight data, here we have two examples of flights that are both continuous descents, as you can see in the altitude profile in the blue and on the right as well. So both are continuous descents, but one is clearly more inefficient because it is not flown at idle thrust. So what you get is more fuel burn when the uh, continuous descent is being operated in this way. So when ANSPs use this conventional measure to uh, measure continuous descents, clearly there are some inefficiencies that are not being taken into account when uh, measuring continuous descents. So what we'd like to look at is a metric that defines if a descent was managed rather than simply it being continuous. So the idea is that uh, if a flight was managed, then this would be facilitating a descent that allows for the predictable dissipation of the aircraft's energy. And it is at the lowest cost to the operator based on the cost index that they've input into uh, the uh, flight profile. And it includes any known constraints that, they've, uh, that they would want to pre-plan for. So facilitating a descent in this way uh, results in improved efficiency and lower noise and lower risk to operations as well. So what we want to do is aim to measure a managed descent rather than a continuous descent, as this is more closely to how operators want to conduct their flight in operations. So this is how we go about um, measuring a managed descent by proxy. So ideally, a managed descent would be identified by onboard aircraft data, but in the absence of that data to ANSPs, we come up with a proxy measure from data that is available to ANSPs, and that is surveillance data. So the scope of the metric is looking at medium and large jets for the performance path, where typically you see a constant MAC and a constant CAS section, which makes up the performance path. And what we want to look at is if there are any large speed deviations that might point towards a flight that is not being managed and is likely being intervened with by ATC during operations. And the target speed profile, namely the constant MAC and the constant CAS profile, is identified by uh, regression. So here you can see the airspeed profile in black um, and the regression is done on the constant MAC section and the constant CAS section. And then this is used to compare the airspeed data to the uh, characteristic uh, constant MAC and constant CAS profile in order to identify if there are any speed deviations that likely point towards it being a non-managed descent and if there are very little uh, speed deviations, then it would be a managed descent. So the deviations, uh, the, th the thresholds for deviations are taken um, by the, uh, the limited by the auto throttle limits and spree brake -like guidelines for managed descents. So I won't go through the whole derivation of the uh, regression and the thresholds um, here today in the interest of time, but if you're interested in looking at that, that's available in the paper. So then what we did was look at the application of the metric uh, for Australian airports. So the six uh, Australian airports in Australia and looked at um, and looked at the uh, scenarios where the traffic levels were high and the traffic levels were low. 
So in particular, this is uh, the scenario when the COVID pandemic was uh, it was beginning to affect the traffic levels in Australia around March in 2020. And the lowest of which was between uh, April to June. So what we did was applied the conventional CDO measure and the managed descent measure and compared between the two, between um, the different months and also uh, looked at the percentages. So what we found was that the managed descent measure is much lower than the conventional CDO measure in both the high and the low traffic scenarios, which is an opportunity to look at uh, further for optimizing for managed descents. And in particular, if we have a look at, a, uh, at the example of Melbourne Airport, which is shown in the light blue line here, between uh, these months here, it was the uh, lowest months for traffic. And you can see that the managed descent uh, measure starts to increase between those months. However, when the traffic starts to increase again for Melbourne Airport between June and July, the managed descent measure uh, abruptly declines. So what this means for Melbourne is there is an opportunity for improving uh, managed descents during the very low traffic scenario and also when the traffic starts to pick up again. So in particular, we can have a look in more detail for managed descents and non-managed descent examples, as you can see here. So this is showing the uh, speed deviations for a uh, what we call a, a non-managed descent by the uh, management by proxy. And we can see the characteristic speed profile in green. <clears throat> so there are speed profiles, uh, speed deviations at different, prof uh, at different points in the profile, for example, here and here. And in particular, when we looked at the speed deviations here and looked at the corresponding lat uh, lateral deviation, uh, when we compare the uh, flight, uh, the lateral track to the actual flight plan track, the actual, when we compare the actual track to the flight plan track, sorry, you can see that there is some evidence of track shortening here, which shows a lateral deviation latent in the descent. So likely this is some intervention that um, the, cr the flight crew was not aware of, which uh, results in the flight crew um, uh, managing the flight uh, manually and correcting the uh, profile. And you can see the speed deviations here. So this is helpful for NSPs to identify areas to further optimize CDO for aircraft uh, for operators and uh, to prevent tactical intervention uh, later on into the descent, which can impact on operator planning of the descent. So in conclusion, these are the key points that I'd like to identify and highlight to you. So firstly, um, NSPs require a, uh, a CDO performance measure that identifies whether a CDO was performed in a predictable and efficient manner, for example, by aircraft automation, rather than the conventional method of uh, measuring level segments. And of course, further work is needed to extend the metric of identifying managed descents to include uh, other aircraft types and also other descent segments with the data that is available to ANSPs. And then thirdly, through CDO implementation guidelines and the development in measuring CDO performance, uh, ANSPs can further optimize services in uh, current and future scenarios to maximize the benefits of CDO to the aviation industry. Uh, so that concludes the presentation for today and thank you very much for your time. If you'd like to get in contact about this work, uh, here's my contact details. Uh, so it's trang.quinn at airservicesaustralia.com. And uh, if you have any questions for this work, I'd uh, be happy to answer them in the current presentation. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Trang, for this interesting presentation. As I said, please, for the public room, you have the possibility to make a question on a question and answer on the side and on Wova. 
Uh, already a first question was posed before the session, but I think it's an interesting one. The question is, uh, here is time-based operation, but I will say time-based flow management is also a part. Are all time-based operation or time-based flow management will, uh, I would say, which benefits we could expect uh, in this post case using your method, it's saying uh, have a better definition of, that, uh, of the CDO application by an aircraft. Sorry, uh, could you please repeat that, Eric? I yes, didn't sorry. Know <laughs> sorry, sorry. Right. Uh, the question is, we, which kind of, uh, of benefit we could have if uh, the project time-based operation or time-based flow management could be uh, better implemented? And uh, do, do you analyze already these kind of things? Uh, at the moment, uh, not yet. We're only analyzing the uh, fuel and the um, the emissions impact uh, uh, relating to the uh, continuous descent operations. But uh, predictability is something that I would like to analyze in the future. Okay, uh, I, I will have an, another question. I don't see a question, but for me, another question. As I said, you, you demonstrate actually that the measure that you are doing is not so well, and we could have a better measure. And if I correctly understand, your better measure show that we have uh, less CDO as uh, we mine. Is this correct? Sorry, again, no, Eric. Uh, so in your presentation. Yes, in your presentation with the conventional CDO, we have a higher rate as a version you found yourself. It said that we have most cases where we don't have a CDO as uh, what is, uh, I would say, uh, reported by the NSP. Sorry, I didn't catch that question. Sorry, Eric. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, again. As I say, if you have um, you make a comparison with your method versus the conventional CDO, yeah, uh, measurement, and the conventional CDO has an higher rate of CDO operation as your measurement. Yes. As I say, that you have a, a, a you you so you demonstrate that we have a difference as as we are uh, better as what we plan today. And my question is, uh, um, do you think we have to change with this KPI? We have to adapt this KPI to be more precise? Yes, so um, uh, that is the, I think the focus of our uh, research here is to um, focus on a different metric rather than the conventional CDO metric um, because the conventional CDO metric uh, only, um, it doesn't uh, fully uh, characterize the uh, flight inefficiencies. For example, if a flight uh, conducted was conducted in uh, non-idle. So um, yeah, this is why we are characterizing a new metric in order to uh, capture the uh, inefficiencies that the uh, conventional CDO uh, metric doesn't. And, and so, yeah. That please. Please. Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if I correct see the pictures as a, after the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the conventional CDO or your CDO don't show a very high increase of CDO operation. We could expect. Uh, do you mean, store... yes, do you mean by the conventional CDO or with the managed descent measure? With your managed descent, we saw a more increase, but it's not so big. I, I was yeah. very surprised if I'm seeing the very low yeah. number of flights, <clears throat> I, I could expect more. Yeah, so um, that is a very interesting result that we are wanting to unpack further. So why is um, the managed descent measure uh, not improving a lot when the uh, traffic is low. And uh, yeah, yeah, as you can see in one of the, those examples, it was due to some uh, track shortening of the path. And um, yeah, that, that intervention was late into the descent as well, which, um, which affected the, uh, the planning for uh, uh, a managed descent or a CDO. So um, 
Yeah, that's something that we would like to uh, investigate a bit further as to why uh, why that was uh, required. Also, it is also for me. I was an aircraft operator in my in my I would say for uh, in my life before. It's a uh, we have too 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 many intervention from uh, from air traffic controller uh, managing descent for low traffic. Or it's a process we um, we oblige an air traffic controller to manage a descent. Yeah, so in that particular example, um, perhaps, uh, yeah, it'll be helpful to NSPs to uh, manage the flow uh, in a different way or um, in a way that uh, doesn't impact uh, on the later parts of the descent uh, uh, so that the uh, crew can um, uh, manage the descent uh, 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 earlier in the descent. Okay, uh, I, we have uh, received another question. Uh, so the question is, there are pass manage and speed manage mode in FMS. So you show this both uh, in a trajectory. If the trajectory show a variable speed profile, could it still be managed? But in pass mode, instead of the speed mode, as there is a managing in an other uh, situation at what you expect in your measurement. Sorry, I'm just having a look at this question now. So there are path managed and speed managed modes in FMS. If a trajectory shows a speed as a variable speed profile, could it still be managed but in path mode instead of a speed mode? Yeah, that is something that we would have to um, investigate a bit further. It's something you have, uh, okay. But I think an interesting question, please. <laughs> As a not it is, don't be, don't be afraid of that. Uh, for me, and, and another question I would say is that you make it to improve the environmental impact. What can do an, an NSP to improve it? Or, the, or what is the further research we have to do to improve the environmental impact? Uh, is the question around yep. <clears throat> what uh, NSPs need to do to improve the environmental impact? Yes, because uh, we, we saw that it managed too much. What can, what is, uh, what can an NSP do, although which kind of research is ne is necessary? Yeah, so I guess the uh, the point of this research is um, uh, highlighting that uh, CDO is a beneficial um, uh, type of operation, and uh, what ANSPs can do is uh, facilitate more CDO in the administered airspace. But in order to do so, um, ANSPs need to uh, come up with a better metric in order to evaluate and then uh, find ways to optimize uh, for uh, CDO in their administered airspace. So yeah, so overall to improve the amount of CDO that's uh, conducted in the administered airspace, because uh, we know that this, uh, this uh, type of operating technique um, is uh, beneficial for environmental impact. Okay. Then I don't see any question uh, coming. As we say, trying. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Please stay at until end of the presentation, uh, and uh, we will go to the next speaker. As so the next speaker is uh, Hendrik Hardel. He's a PhD student at uh, Linköping University and Luftfahrtverkehr in Sweden. I've I hope I say it correctly, uh, Enric. Uh, and uh, is uh, today's speech concern is uh, toward a comprehensive characterization of the arrival operation in the terminal area. As a small less is the same sujet, and I will be it would be very interesting to compare the two. As as Enric, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric, for the introduction, and hello, everyone. I will just share my screen here. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Henry Cadell, uh, and I will present this paper that I worked on together with my colleagues at Linköping University, Anastasia, Tatiana, and Lucy, and also Karim from Eurocontrol. 
so in this work, we are presenting an approach targeting a comprehensive characterization of the arrival operations within the terminal airspace, uh, which is an area of airspace that is considered one of the main contributors to inefficiency in, in air traffic. Uh, so what we do is that we use some existing and new performance metrics uh, that we apply to three European airports uh, that all use different metering and, and sequencing techniques. Uh, so the airports that we have chosen are Dublin with the point merge procedures, we have Stockholm Arlanda with the uh, vectoring and uh, Vienna airport with the trombone procedures. Uh, and all the three airports, they have around 220,000 to 270,000 aircraft movements annually, uh, so they are comparable in, in size. Uh, and we are only interested in looking at the operations inside the TMA, uh, which we could do for, for Arlanda and Vienna, but for Dublin we had to extend it to a 50 nautical mile circle around the airport uh, to cover some of the eastbound arrivals, so we'll, we'll show that in a figure later on. Uh, so I will just uh, briefly introduce the airports and the procedures. Uh, so here you can see the point merge procedures at Dublin and Dublin has a main runway which is used 95% of the time uh, for both the arrivals and the departures. Uh, and it also has the, the sequencing legs of the point merge in opposite direction that is used uh, uh, to, to sequence the aircraft and uh, at which they fly at, at level flight before they are instructed to turn to watch the merge point. Uh, and for Stockholm Arlanda, uh, it has three runways and uh, one parallel pair that is mostly used during the busy hours of operation. Uh, and uh, Stockholm Arlanda operates a mix of the closed stars and open stars that uh, needs the vectoring. So. We use, for example, here runway zero one right uh, that use open loop vectoring only. Uh, so the aircraft need to be to be vector from the initial approach fixes to the final approach. Uh, and then finally, we can look at Vienna Airport that has um, two intersecting runways that are also split uh, for the departures and the arrivals. Uh, and it has a set of stars uh, and four initial approach fixes fixes. Uh, from uh, from which the transition trombone transition connects to to the final approach and, and along those trombones there are waypoints for path stretching uh, and shortcuts for for the sequencing of, of the traffic. Uh, and over to the data. So for the data we obtain from the historical database of the Open Sky networks uh, that takes the data from the ADSB transponders on, on board the aircraft, uh, and more specifically we use the, the state data that. Um, represent parts of the arriving flight trajectories inside the TMA. Uh, and uh, we uh, used uh, the month with the highest number of, of arrivals at our three airports, uh, which happened to be in, in October 2019. Uh, so before we, we could uh, start analyzing and using the data, we had to perform some data cleaning. Uh, so, for example, fix some incorrect positioning and uh, smooth the altitudes and uh, removing some trajectories that uh, are for non-commercial flights that uh, includes the go-arounds and, and uh, uh, landing too far from the runway or trajectories that are, that are incomplete. Uh, and the final data set then that we worked with include only the peak time periods in, in October 2019. Uh, so what we did in order to obtain this data set is that we calculated the hours per hour time in TMA for each airport, uh, and then we removed the 0 0.7 percentile from those set of values, and then we obtain a peak time period data sets for, for all the three airports. Uh, so over to the methodology then. So the first thing we looked into was the additional distance. So uh, here to the right, you can see the three different TMAs of the airports. We have Vienna Airport, we have um, uh, Stockholm Arlanda, and we have uh, no, we have Dublin. Sorry, Stockholm Arlanda and Vienna. Uh, and you can also see the the uh, arrival trajectories uh, of, of the arriving aircraft, uh, which are here colored because um, we assign them to different clusters depending on where they actually enter the TMA. Uh, and then for each cluster, we create the so-called idle reference trajectory, which uh, starts at the cluster centroid and uh, goes directly to the final approach. Uh, and then 
we can actually use the idle reference directory to compare with the uh, length of the actual arrival directories of the aircraft to obtain the additional distance in TMA. Uh, we are also interested in the, the vertical efficiency of the flights. Uh, so uh, for that, we, for example, look at the time of flight levels. And for that, we use the, uh, the definition by Eurocontrol, which is that a level segment uh, is considered when the vertical speed is below 300 feet per minute for at least uh, 30 seconds. Uh, and additionally, for each uh, arriving aircraft, we create two different uh, vertical reference trajectories that perform a continuous descent. Uh, so here to the right, you have an example uh, with a red trajectory being the actual trajectory of the aircraft. And you can see the corresponding yellow uh, vertical profile here that is not very efficient in this example. So then what we do is that we uh, based on the same uh, horizontal distance, we create the CDO, which is here represented by the by the red line. Uh, so we take away the, the vertical inefficiency. And then we also use uh, the corresponding horizontal reference trajectory from the corresponding cluster and also assign a CDO to that trajectory, which is corresponds to the blue line here. So we have both reference directory one and reference directory two, of course, that is assigned to, to each of the flights. Uh, and furthermore, we look at the vertical deviation by assessing the vertical deviation from a reference, uh, from the CDO reference profile. And we look at that for uh, the last 10 minutes prior to final. Uh, and in order to evaluate the environmental efficiency, we look into the additional fuel burn of the flights. So uh, we calculate the fuel burn for uh, both the actual arriving uh, flights and for the reference trajectories corresponding to, to each flight. Uh, so what we do then is we use the Eurocontrol BADA tool uh, to uh, calculate the additional fuel burn for uh, both the reference trajectories when they are performing the CDO with idle thrust and for the, the actual trajectories. Uh, and we were also considering the wind and temperature conditions when performing those calculations. Uh, and uh, we also utilize this um, clustering that we performed uh, to also look at the cluster separately. So uh, not only looking at the whole picture for an airport, we look at individual clusters to investigate what is actually the performance of the individual clusters at an airport when it comes to horizontal vertical inefficiency and the additional fuel burn. Uh, and then we also, additionally, we also want to capture the, the entry conditions to the airports, which require uh, several steps uh, to, to, to get there. So first we need to calculate the minimum time to final, which we do by first plotting the, the actual arrival trajectories. And then we overlay a square grid. Uh, and uh, we have a, a cell size here of uh, one nautical mile. Uh, and then uh, for each uh, such cell, we calculate the minimum time to, to final among all the, the aircraft trajectories that pass uh, each cell. And then we obtain this uh, heat map visualization. Uh, and from the minimum time to final, we then ob obtain the throughput, with, which is defined as the number of aircraft with a minimum time to final within a given time window. Uh, we use ISO minimum timelines from 600 to 30 seconds to final. Uh, and a 30 second sampling rate uh, over five minute periods. And from the minimum time to final and the, the throughput, we finally obtain the metering effort, which we are interested in. Uh, and the metering effort is then defined as the difference between the throughput at the given time horizon and the one close to the final. Uh, and it can be used to quantify the controller's effort for metering uh, and also then for, uh, for a proxy to control his workload. So now I will present some of the results that we obtain. Uh, so to the, left, to the left here, you can see the results of the additional distance in, in TMA. So we can see that the median value for, for Dublin uh, is, is the greatest when we compare the three airports. Uh, and we can also see uh, similar results when we evaluate the time flown level that doubling having the highest median value 
followed by uh, Vienna and then by Stockholm or Lambda. Uh, for the vertical deviation uh, compared to the reference profile, uh, we can see uh, similar values for uh, Dublin and Arlanda, but here it is Vienna that uh, has the best performance. Uh, and when we evaluate the additional fuel burn, you see here that uh, it says RT1 and RT2. So RT1 here is the additional fuel burn of the actual trajectories when we compare them to the uh, reference CDO that flies the, the same horizontal route. And RT2 is when we compare to both a CDO and the shortest route to the final approach. Uh, so we can see that for Arlanda and Vienna, RT1 and RT2 additional fuel burn are quite similar, but uh, there is a significant difference uh, for RT1 and RT2 for Dublin. So, and this tells us that um, uh, there is also a significant part of the additional fuel burn that comes from uh, horizontal inefficiency, inefficiency for Dublin, not only by vertical inefficiency. Uh, and then when we look at the horizontal spread, uh, how much of the uh, TMA that is actually used by the aircraft, uh, we can see some similar results for Dublin and all under 64 and 59 percent, but for Vienna you can see that uh, a lot of the TMA is actually used. Uh, and Dublin shows the, the significantly higher values of minimum time to final, which is also consistent with the results that we obtain when we look at the additional distance results. Uh, and uh, this shows the figures of the metering effort and uh, which indicate uh, significant differences. Uh, so you can see that Dublin has a peak of, at three aircraft at 400 seconds to final, Arlanda around 1.2 1, 1 at 600, and Vienna uh, about two aircraft at 200 uh, seconds to final. So this tells us that, that the entry conditions to the airport are, are quite different. Uh, now I will just quickly go through some examples of uh, the uh, clustering results that we obtained. Uh, so, for example, if you look at cluster three here at Arlanda, uh, you can see that there is a noticeable difference between the RT1 and RT2 additional fuel burn, uh, which is consistent with the high additional fuel burn that we obtain, and we have quite a moderate uh, time flown level. Uh, and we also see similar patterns for, for example, cluster one and cluster five in Dublin with a noticeable difference between RT1 and RT2, high additional distances and a moderate time flown level. And the last couple of examples I would like to present is um, uh, here you can see all on the cluster five, we have quite a small difference between RT1 and RT2 additional fuel burn. Uh, and uh, which is consistent with a low additional distance in TMA uh, and a quite a high uh, time flown level, which actually contributes to the extra fuel burn. Uh, and uh, for cluster four here, for example, in, in uh, Vienna, uh, we have a negative difference between RT1 and RT2. Uh, so the RT1 and RT2 trajectories are actually longer than, than RT1, which is confirmed by the additional distance. A low additional distance and uh, quite a high uh, time flow level, which actually contributes to the extra fuel burn. Uh, and then one interesting uh, cluster is a cluster eight in here in, in uh, Dublin that we have very low RT1 additional fuel burn, but still we have vertical inefficiency as you can see. But this was because of it's mostly turboprop aircraft that arrive from this cluster that have quite a low uh, cruise altitude. And then when we apply the CDOs, the top of descent is, uh, is uh, very close to the airport. So they will have a cruise uh, part also in the CMA. So that's why we see this kind of results. So to conclude my presentation, uh, what we have done is to evaluate the arrival efficiency at uh, three Europe European airports with uh, different airspace complexity and different sequencing and merging techniques. Uh, we have both evaluated for all flights combined and per flow. Uh, and the results reveal that the situations among the three airports uh, are uh, very different. And, uh, but we have to keep in mind that we cannot make a fair comparison without taking into account the, the entry conditions to the airport, which we could see were also very different. Uh, and also then further studies would be required uh, to analyze the flight efficiency under comparable entry conditions. 
Uh, and for future work, uh, we will also consider uh, to break down uh, the two main sources of inefficiency, so both the airspace and operations, uh, and also take into account uh, weather conditions as well as other sources of perturbations and uncertainties. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Some question has already coming. Uh, I would say to uh, Christian Perdonik, I see only a part, but I don't see the question. Uh, something is probably wrong. If you could put a question, I would be happy. Uh, one of the questions was uh, answered. Uh, it was uh, which specific cluster method uh, you have used um, for, to define in which arrival flight is in which trajectory? Did you analyze different method and why you choose a method uh, that you chose? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I'm not really sure actually which method we used. I, I was one of my colleagues that works on the clustering actually, and I don't know I'm sorry, I don't really know what was the reason why this method was used. I, I will, uh, I can definitely for sure look into that and, and get back with an answer to that question. Okay, then thank you very much. Uh, the second question that I will ask is, uh, I'll say it's the same as before. Uh, it was put on a question and is for you very interesting. It, it is possible, it was a question, it is possible to know exactly which is the effect, expected outcome of the time bias operation or the time bias flow management. I would say both are more or less in the same direction and we will benefit from this uh, kind of operation. Yeah, so, so our first uh, target was to actually try to find the, yeah, the, the positives and the negatives with, with the different kind of sequencing and merging techniques. But then we found out that there are very many differences between the airports as well as we could see from the entry conditions as well. So we could not make um, a fair comparison. Uh, but um, I think also the the benefits uh, would be for airports and ANSP to to see the the efficiencies both when it comes to vertical inefficiency, horizontal and fuel burn, and also that we can. Uh, we can break down them into different separate clusters so they can they can see where most of the inefficiencies exist and if the uh, what contributes the most to the additional fuel burn that uh, that we see if it's uh, horizontal if it's vertical inefficiency as we could see from dublin for example the there were both the horizontal and also the vertical inefficiency, but for, for uh, Dublin and, and for Alanda and Vienna, it was mostly due to the vertical inefficiency. So that could be some important um, um, uh, findings for airports and ANSP. Uh, I would have another question. As I, uh, imagine I'm uh, ANSP. I have to implement uh, order to adapt, to, to change, to modify my team. Uh, which is them I have to use, just point match and vectoring or in trombone? Yeah, <laughs> that's the, as I, as I also <laughs> answered in the, in the previous question, that was also the, the main uh, uh, thing that we were interested in to trying to, to find out. But I think at this point, we cannot uh, say which one is the, the better, better method. But uh, I think when, if we uh, actually, find uh, more more similar uh, operations under uh, more comparable entry conditions, we could uh, perhaps make some kind of judgment on that as well. So that would be also some uh, interesting uh, research for the future, I guess. As as we have to open the research for the future in this case, eh? yeah. uh, on this level. Uh, so for me, next question, I, I didn't receive any question, but I have a lot of, you know, and former operator. Uh, my my question is if you are looking uh, the idea is still the same is to reduce our environmental map footprint what could be for your opinion the best proposal that we could do today after you analyze a lot of flight uh, to achieve this target you mean to to decrease the environmental footprint of course because it's yeah, uh, yeah. it's the most important point yeah, sure. Um, and I think it's it's um, 
so a lot regarding predict predictability, I think, also when it comes to the, the operations of the, the descent. Uh, so, uh, for example, that uh, you, you need to be able to, to plan a, a good, uh, good descent and, and don't have to, to spend uh, so much time on the on flying level segments to be able to actually perform that kind of descent. So, uh, and also good good planning and, and sequencing uh, of the traffic that comes into the TMA, I would say. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, in this case, from, from your opinion and from your measurement, at the time we entrant the aircraft and come into the TMA, uh, you could optimize something or uh, I say the game is already played? Uh, no, I, we could definitely optimize uh, uh, I think it's it's important to both look at the, the the parts that are outside the TMA, but also the operations inside the TMA that we could to could uh, use of course optimization to to optimize the trajectories and and, and speeds and so on to to uh, so that uh, the aircraft interact with each other in a better way so that they don't interfere with each other so that you have a, a better flow of traffic for sure. And, uh, and if I was uh, looking your presentation about uh, Dublin, as I said, actually it seemed to be that Dublin has the um, most important problem on the time, I think, if I correct, uh, remember. Uh, could you imagine, or did you identify why? Is it because some aircraft are coming and not planned or uh, on a correct, not on a correct flight level or? Did, did you have some, obviously, some some guess? Yeah, I think we also need to need to remember that in for for um, Dublin they only have a single runway as well, so they need to have the departures on the runways as well. So they cannot assign all the arrivals to to the to the runway based on the only the minimum separation of the aircraft. So uh, and then, yeah. It's also I don't know if we look at the the airspace that there is around and if other NSP taken care of or other parts of the area or airspace and how they um, interact and, and cooperate with each other. So that could be different reasons why why we see those kind of results. Yeah. Okay, I I don't see any new question coming. As I think your presentation was uh, was clear enough, or that was very clear. Uh, I thank you very much in this case, and uh, we will go to the next one. Uh, please, uh, for everybody, we know we called uh, as a speaker. Uh, we'll try to answer uh, on a Q and A the question uh, after the presentation, so you could read the answer directly from the present from the speaker. Uh, the next speaker will be for another subject. It will be uh, Ricardo. Ricardo, are you here? Yeah, yes. Can you can you hear me? I could hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ricardo Rice is working for the Embraer Research uh, and Technology. Uh, he leads uh, Embraer participation in several Horizon 2020 project, uh, and he will present us uh, towards single pilot operation, a conceptual framework to manage in-flight incapacitation. Um, oh, you are uh, you are busy with. Uh, I'm on duty also. <laughs> sorry. Yes, I'm exactly. I need to. Not I'm a sorry. problem. Is is very is very kind to have it. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you have uh, 15 minutes for your presentation. Okay, are you seeing my screen? Just checking. Yes, I see it correctly. Okay. Okay, so what I bring you is a, is a little bit different from the two previous uh, presentations. So uh, this project, SafeLand, it is a CESAR project and we are developing a conceptual framework to manage in-flight incapacitation for single pilot operations. So um, these operations, uh, these are the partners of the of the project and basically to give you some some context background what we have today is a two pilot uh, operation so two pilots on board we are speaking about commercial commercial operations 
of class 25 aircraft and we see a movement towards the single pilot operations with just one pilot on board and the remote pilot or the assistant on the ground giving support to these onboard pilots. And one of the main questions that happens is what if this pilot gets incapacitated? If he's partially or fully knocked out, what should we do? In fact, there are several other projects and lots of research being done on, on these, but basically they are looking for the cockpit or detecting incapacitation and not much as being done to think about the ground. So we are focusing on, on the ground. So what is this, this ground station uh, person doing? How are the procedures with the, with the ATC? What is the impact? On the, on, the, on the ATM and the onboard automation. And, and so how did we do this? So we um, first we identified what tasks should be done by these uh, uh, single pilots. And in case he's not there anymore, he is incapacitated. Andre, uh, I'm sorry. Um, how can we distribute it? And so what we did was to clearly have um, create two three scenarios which are so the first one is driven by by the ATC so most of these tasks should go to the ATC the second one they should go to a ground station pilot and the other the first scenario they should be more automation okay so, and, so um, we we set up a few a few a few um, an exercise with uh, uh, specialists to design on top of the three scenarios and then we converge into uh, a single hybrid scenario. So we look at the operational feasibility, impact on safety, human factors, liability, certification costs until we arrive at this baseline conceptual scenario that merges the best um, characteristics of these, uh, of these three hypothetical philosophies. And now what we are doing, so this was during this final concept definition, and now we are going into, the target is to have some real-time simulations that will be done at the DLR and the safety assessment. And meanwhile, to prepare this, while our colleagues at DLR and Eurocontrol are preparing the, the, the simulators for the real time, we set up a group of low fidelity evaluations to evaluate the procedures and, and generate already a first understanding of how we translate this conceptual framework into uh, a, real, a real work. I, I will speak to you a little bit about that. But the key points that we want to bring is that these ground stations, they will in the least monitor the, the, the aircraft systems and the, and the pilot health. We need uh, much more sophisticated and advanced onboard systems that we have today. I think that should be clear from the, from the onset, but they are, we don't believe they will be enough sophisticated to assume the authority we are looking at uh, uh, entering to service around 2035, according to, to, to EASA and the advanced ATM um, uh, roadmap. And we have this question here that is not so much maybe to do with, with what technology can do, but our uh, social technical framework. So, so the flight authority uh, cannot be uh, delegated to, to, to automation and this plays around with the full concept. The other key point was to minimize changes to the current ATM uh, processes and, and procedures. So it should be transparent, the most transparent possible for the, the ATM side. And it will be very desirable that there is a strong connection and coupling between the ground station and what we call the airline uh, operation control center because you have uh, engineers there, you have dispatchers, you have uh, um, a group of, of extra knowledge that you can or you should draw upon to help solve uh, or support the ground station pilot in case 
yes to be uh, managing the the aircraft and, and solving uh, for supporting the, the the flight so like i said there is no nominal uh, single pilot there is no single pilot um uh, operation today for for commercial uh, flights in this in this magnitude and so there's lots of discussion but we adopted um these um these operational concepts from Smith and Korn from 2017, where basically you break the flight in three phases. And, and so for during the, the takeoff and climb, and mostly descent to land, you have a one-to-one -one relationship, so one ground station to one airplane. And during cruise flight, which is a less critical and less eventful phase, you can have a ground station that um, supports and monitors uh, and aircraft from five to ten it depends on the capabilities of the of course this ground station uh, person and the surrounding technology so in the flight so basically your onboard pilot is the pilot in command is the captain of the ship is the, the man at, uh, at um, the ultimate responsible for the, the the flight is best positioned to be there and during the flight you have the endovers between these uh, three types of uh, ground stations for departure, for crews, and for arrival. So um, what happens with incapacitation on route? So we designed a couple of uh, procedures where there is the, the detection of the incapacitation and the, the cruise ground station, he assumes the, um, the, the pilot in command but then it needs to transfer to a one-to-one -one relationship for the, for the uh, standby ground station uh, operator or pilot that becomes the pilot in command. So there is a first takeover of the controls of the aircraft and then an handover to a dedicated uh, person. So we assume that will be, we don't know how this magic will happen in fact, but there will be a, a automated system to detect incapacitation. Of course, incapacitation uh, should and, and can also be detected by deviations of uh, planning of the aircraft by the pilot not responding to calls or uh, requests for procedures like happens today because technology might fail there is no no 100 percent foolproof uh, uh, system that at least i'm aware of but what we we start is that if the automated system, which is highly reliable, detects this, this incapacitation, it's already set up, uh, the, the, the automation on board keeps following the, 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 the flight plan, the ATC is worn and clears the airspace, the cruise ground station pilot take over control, assumes the authority of the flight, there is this end over to a standby ground station pilot, and this is important because as this ground station pilot is responsible for the flight and he is the one that will keep up with the flight until the landing. Uh, we realize he should be the one most involved in deciding an alternative airport. The decision to alternate, to divert to another airport or keep off the flight should be taken by the person or, or at least by the person that will re be responsible to following it to the to the ground and so the ground station pilot in fact becomes the ultimate authority on this uh, decision for diversion there is an emergency declaration and and all the procedures to to land and here it's important that the automation really needs to be highly sophisticated to minimize uh, problems inside for instance this, this ground station in fact he acts on top of the of the automation you will not have, we don't expect him to have like direct controls like your yoke or, or pedals or thrust levers because he will act on top of the automation. The, the delays and the latency would impact probably in his ability to offer, um, to act directly on the trajectory of the, of, of the, of the aircraft. So if the incapacitation happens, for instance, in descent in the TMA, that's a, a, high, a more critical uh, stage, but at the same time, we already have a one-to-one -one relationship. If you remember back, so at this point, you should already be one-to-one, -one, so your arrival ground station operator or pilot will assume the, 
take control of the flight, declares to the to the ATC, we have this emergency, pilot incapacitation. I am the pilot in command. I am responsible for the flight from, from now on, and it follows emergency declaration and, 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 and landing. So there is an onboard system detecting the pilot incapacitation. This is a simplification for safe land. Like I said, it can be also declared by not following procedures or a, something abnormal being detected in the management of the of the of the flight declaration of uh, of the of the problem for squawk and and ATC is getting on the in the loop by clearing the the, the airspace and your arrival uh, ground station takes control uh, looks at the trajectory the systems of the airplane if anything else develops gets the emergency and lands uh, the automation supports the e monitors and, and manages the, 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 the landing. And so um, we are based on three ground station operator roles that can have and, and can uh, ramify. We'll study that later in, for instance, different uh, qualifications. But departure, cruise, and arrival are different stages of the flight with different implications, different uh, criticality. The, the role of this onboard automation is in fact uh, uh, crucial and we aligned all our procedures and developing with the current uh, requirements and, and, and guidelines from from ECAO, for instance for remote pilot aircraft and overs so also because we are in cesar we are discussing atm so we are driving these to minimize the impact on 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 ATM, so we don't want to create extra roles or responsibilities in the in the for the for the ATC. Um, during cruise, um, our ground station, so the cruise ground station, is uh, controlling mostly well automated UAS, and like I said, it is not expected to do uh, control of the aircraft under manual control. So. Uh, trying to wrap it up. So like I said, we will have our real-time simulations with COVID and everything else. It will open in, in, in at DLR in Braunschweig in Germany um, uh, next year, February, uh, March, we, we hope. But before that, we set up what we call low fidelity simulations. This was a cooperation with uh, these other uh, Horizon 2020 project called SafeMode, which is developing methods and tools for a human human uh, centered design of, of complex systems and basically we did these simulations using powerpoint and microsoft teams we got eight pilots so we did eight events where they they um, uh, trialed the concept from a great uh, ground station point of view landing at budapest airport we we threw at them a couple of scenarios of incapacitation like a no frills incapacitation, incapacitation during vectoring. So, so, so the airplane gets vectoring instructions from, from the ATC and, and the pilot gets incapacitated in the middle of this vectoring. So what happens? And it allows us to get a first glimpse and understanding if the concept is, is feasible, where are some detail points that we can explore more and, and give directions to, to better design these real-time simulation uh, setup and, and use. And we are planning a second wave of these low fidelity because they are more cheaper to explore other situations um, regarding the, the incapacitation. So uh, last, next year, around May, we will aim to do a final uh, concept presentation workshop and in November, a, a final dissemination. We provoke, encourage, instigate you to join in the advisory board, the most diverse um, uh, views that you can bring and, and your experience so we can robust the, the, the concept. Uh, SafeLand is a preliminary research project, so we aim to create a, um, a set of, of guidelines and inputs for further projects to improve and mature the, the concept. So we are focusing how to deal with this from the ground. So not, not on the cockpit, but from the, from the ground. 
you can get, of course, uh, public deliverables from the from the website that uh, is here on top, safeland slash um, uh, iPhone project EU. You can get this on on Twitter, LinkedIn, and ResearchGate. But uh, really, if you get the human touch, I encourage you to contact Stefano Bonelli. He is the manager of the of the of the project. His email is here. Of course, you can also send me a, an, an, an email um, to better understand or, or, uh, or collaborate with the project. Also, not here, but we are part of, there are a couple of Cesar projects like Evercat and others that deal with the remote pilot aircraft, their insertion in the, in the, in the airspace, dealing with the technical void and so on. And, and we have this joint forum where we exchange information between all because uh, these capabilities that are being developed for remote pilot aircraft and their insertion in the airspace they feed and 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 help uh, all the all the projects and so sorry if i was too quick and for the um, my little helper intervention in the beginning of the the presentation and uh, if you have any questions um, please, I'm, I'm here to try to answer them. Yes, uh, thank you, Ricardo. And uh, yes, your, your help uh, is, a, is a future uh, uh, passenger or perhaps a future airliner. That's not a problem for us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before we come to the question, uh, Christian, I want to apologize. Uh, I was not able to see your question on my web interface. I start my mobile phone and I see your question. Enric, please, could you answer per writing the question to, from uh, Christian Fadonk? It would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, I received a Cohen question for you, Enric. You, you put it in your presentation, I'm quite sure. Uh, not Enric, sorry, Ricardo. Something is wrong. Uh, here on the picture because I see Enric and it must be Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo, well, the first question that I that I received was, uh, will a GSP, this is will a ground uh, servicing pilot working uh, with multiple single piloted aircraft uh, at the same time? And in which condition? You present it, I think, but I think it was not clear enough. Ricardo? Uh, uh, Ricardo? Uh, Matthias, could, could you show this? Could you look at with Ricardo if something is, uh, is going? Um, he shut off his, his um he muted himself, so I don't know where he went. Ricardo, um, could you help me? Uh, yes. Do you have a contact, uh, Matthias, with Ricardo? Yes, I'm trying to contact him right now. Okay. But uh, don't hesitate to, to, uh, to write your question. Uh, like I say, uh, every speaker could answer the question uh, um, on a Q&A so that uh, after the session also, it will be visible. This is, uh, don't be afraid of that. Ricardo, okay. can you? You are, you are back. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Now okay. Uh, sorry, there was a problem with the connection, but my audio is through the mobile, so the similar technologies, which are great. Uh, it's sorry, great. I, I will try to get the slides back. But the question directly: so you have um, three stages of the flight. So during departure and climb, you will have a one-to-one. -one so, so the, the concept adopted, the operational concept adopted, aims at what should, what is more probable 
to put in place uh, when you start these types of operations. And so um, from that, we thought that departure and arrival, you have uh, arrival descent, you have a one-to-one -one relationship. One ground station operator or pilot to one aircraft. But in the middle of the flight during cruise, it's a more uneventful um, uh, flight stage. Uh, you have more time to deal with any problems that, that come up. And so there, the, the ground station um, is looking at multiple aircraft. He's not controlling them, but is monitoring them. It can receive requests from these aircraft for support. And so there, the ground station can uh, directly provide the support or call other resources like the airliner operation control center or whatever to support the, the onboard pilots. But in the cruise segment, you have a one to many uh, relationship. Okay, thank you. Uh, a second question is, uh, is coming on a principle is, uh, I'm, I make it very easy. Uh, at which time you think it will be in operation? And which step should we be done uh, until this that? Um, I think, uh, so the, the expected would be around, I believe, uh, from, from the, the different roadmaps like EASA and, and, and uh, European um, ATM uh, roadmap and so on, took, uh, in, the, in the decade of the 30s, so let's say around 2035. I believe that there are some, some, some huge challenges still to be this is how do you detect incapacitation or how do you design the social technical system to be immune to incapacitation? You don't have that many incapacitation cases, uh, but if there is an accident with an incapacitation and you don't solve it successfully, the, the media impact and the impact of these types of um, of operations can be devastating and, and delay, delay them. And so um, I think you will need to, to prove the concept, maybe with pilots um, operations. Um, I will say that we can draw, um, upon, we will draw a lot upon what is being done today with the UAM and uh, U space uh, um, pilot uh, regions. Maybe you, you you have these also pilot operations for some 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 regions, also for some type of operations. Like for instance, cargo makes more sense than to start already with um, with the with commercial passenger uh, uh, flights. And so it, it must be a stepwise uh, um, approach. Um, to make this uh, to make this work and make every all the ecosystem familiar with these operations, so we minimize um, accidents, also because of uh, transition uh, um, effects. Um, because uh, there will be a, and, and when we see this, uh, we can imagine how this could work, and we can develop the technology. But when you deploy these in operations, all sorts of uh, kinks um, appear up, and uh, we must uh, grow up the, the boundary with the, with with sureness. So, I would say with um, with pilot uh, operations uh, restricted, and we'll build on 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 top of that. Uh, Ricardo, I see so, also a lot of question coming about the cost benefits analysis on this situation. Did you do something like this? Uh, we did a, a preliminary uh, uh, assessment. We will have a, a final a final one that we will be developing in the in the next uh, year. Um, we also um, need to to look into these if there are needs for for um, infrastructure or if you are looking for the the concept itself for for deployment um 
there will be, of course, there is the impact of the balance of usually uh, wages of uh, people because one of the main drivers, you, you take one of the pilots on board, right? But uh, you don't want to increase the number of people on the ground so much that you will uh, kill these 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 advantage. You cannot sacrifice on the other end um, safety, and this will probably also shift uh, with uh, with time as as you uh, gain security and robustness and understanding. Uh, I think the business model uh, and the viability will also uh, simplify and um, and change. And so um, if, if you want to be involved or, or contribute that, that's a one activity that we will um, restart um, uh, next year because also different types of operations have different impacts. <clears throat> a single pilot operation for uh, going across the Atlantic will be, uh, I mean, cost-wise, um, will be a little bit different from a medium haul or a regional operation for instance. Okay, and uh, Ricardo, open say uh, I received, I saw on my uh, on my phone a lot of questions coming. I says for the public one, please, if you you could continue to to put question for all free. I says please uh, write before uh, for for who is a question, and please for the speaker uh, answers. Could you answer the question by writing because the timing is very short and like that you know. I will thank uh, thank uh, Trank, Enric, and Ricardo for your presentation, your time. It was a very interesting. It was an honor for me to to share this uh, this um, I would say this session. Uh, we will have uh, yet if uh, Matthias is ready uh, some presentation of poster. Uh, he say uh, please uh, go to the poster. Look, the posters are very interesting. And uh, don't forget to vote if you found one of the posters better than the other one. Uh, Matthias, are you ready for the small video? Thank you. Beacon aims to design and test models to reduce the cost impact caused by ATFM delays in a framework in which all the actors involved are interpreted as active agents who make decisions. To capture the characteristics of the airspace agent's decision process, Beacon exploits the behavioral economics theory that provides the tools to identify and model the human biases which affect their behavior. In the first stage of the project, three new market mechanisms have been studied and designed in order to explore different kinds of agents' interactions. In the second stage, all mechanisms will be tested using two different agent-based simulators, strategic and tactical including the agent's bounded rationality scheme, modeled and calibrated via user's input data collected by simple surveys and human-in-the-loop real-time simulations. Flight is late and the crew is considering different alternatives to optimize their trajectory. But how to consider temporal uncertainties such as holdings at arrival? Once the flight finally gets to the gate, one could think it's easy to translate that delay into cost, but is it? Some passengers may have connections. Will the connection flight still be there? And how long will it take for the passengers to actually make that connection? With the same arrival time, that cost could
could be or not materialized. This makes cost functions a complex stochastic process. The expected cost of arrival should be considered by the optimization. Pilot 3, a clean sky project, will integrate these stochastic dynamic cost functions into a full optimization frame. Thank you, Matthias. So, so I take it over for everybody. Uh, I think we had uh, three very interesting presentations, two, two presentations about our TMA and arrival uh, management, uh, seeing that uh, it's not, uh, if I could see, not really uh, where uh, our environmental footprint is the best one, and showing that we, we in the aviation industry have to continue to work on this subject if we want to improve to improve our situation. And uh, we had, uh, as a third presentation uh, from a single operating pilot, something interesting that we will see in the next, if I correct, uh, remember 10 to 15 years, uh, saying that uh, we have a lot of uh, problem to solve, as on the technology part of you, of the liability on, uh, on a procedure, etc., but uh, it's interesting to start it. As I, again, I will thank uh, free. As I say, uh, uh, trying uh, would be about ten or eleven in Australia yet. Uh, Enric in Sweden and Ricardo, and I wish uh, you everybody uh, good ACD. Don't forget to see and to vote the poster, and uh, enjoy the day. Bye-bye, everybody.